Hi everyone, this is a good video, a good video, I do hope you watch to the end, this is a patron sponsored video, I want to basically present the information on the little pyramids, um, uh, someone asked me about the little pyramids at Giza, but after that I'm going to present why there are nine pyramids at Giza, I think I've found the reason why it's in old mythology, it's to do with the nine worlds of Norse mythology and pyramid is a world mountain so there are nine of them and you'll see all the different worlds it's, it's uh exciting to say the least anyway this patron so first we'll present present the conventional view and then we'll present the alternate view so um someone asked me a patron asked me why no one ever makes videos there's barely in, any information on these little pyramids what are they for what's going on so now in this video first I'm going to present the conventional explanation from two top Egyptian pyramid archaeologists and then I'm going to actually present my explanation so you'll need to watch to the end to hear it if you want to hear it and we're finally going to explain why there are nine pyramids at Giza I think so thanks and stay tuned so and rather than just using Wikipedia I want to give you information from my personal library on these mysterious and unspoken of pyramids are they part of the original plan or were they added later now don't forget as an aside i'll be speaking in july at this uh, stephen evans conference online you might want to get a ticket for a weekend day and uh, to tune in and you'll hear all about aboriginal australia weird aboriginal supernatural weird ancient stone massive stone structures that used to be in australia and that have been mostly demolished unfortunately and i've i've sort of uncovered lots of information about the one in victoria hence i'm speaking at this conference anyway and I'll be giving a nice keynote presentation, which I'm working on quite a lot, actually. So, at the outset, let me state that these little pyramids are not all the same. Most of them seem to be a simple layered structure, like a repetition of the appearance of the Third Dynasty Zosa Pyramid. This has possibly contributed to some, such as very prominently Robert Temple, in his brilliant and highly recommended Egyptian Dawn 2010, in saying that Giza was likely built around 3000 BC at the dawn of civilization, and then hijacked by later Egyptians, the Khufu dynasty, for their own burial, burial use. Now, Temple conducted stone dating with an Italian colleague, and he actually found that the Menkore Pyramid dates to 3000 BC, so that's uh, 400 years before the archaeologist's state. Um, of course, even if um, uh, Khufu um, uh, did not build the, the Giza pyramids um, and his, his family, he probably hijacked the site anyway, and this really confuses the issue for us. So, um, uh, now back to the little pyramids. We're going to use Mark Lena's The Complete Pyramids, as well as a, a little bit from Miroslav Werner's The Pyramids, 1997. These two are among the two most comprehensive and scholarly books produced on the Egyptian pyramids. So let's start with the gold standard book on the Egyptian pyramids, The Complete Pyramids, 1997. Um, by Mark Lena, and the other book's also 97, and, it's, and uh, Lena's book is published by Thames and Hudson, uh, which literally do the very best ancient mystery books by obscure authors, because their philosophies, lots of pictures, illustrations, photos, so the book is like a museum. Anyway, what we're looking at in the large Giza pyramids, uh, by comparison, is a type of buttressing in terms of its construction, and we don't actually seem to see that in the smaller pyramids, so... Hmm, who built the smaller pyramids? Now, um, we're not sure what structure exists inside the Giza pyramids, but we assume it's a buttress structure due to the collapsed Medum pyramid, which has a buttress structure, which, ha which is a fourth dynasty pyramid. And it's uncertain if this was used in the small pyramids. So, um, what, the, what do the pyramids look like? They're facing, in a way, north. They're, the shafts all face, the entrances are all facing north, but... They're like an army racing for the rising sun. Um, Khufu's pyramid is closest to the edge of the plateau, closest to the rising sun, facing the former city of Heliopolis. It would have been biggest in terms of viewpoint from the city and closest to the sun. But the three little pyramids in front of it are actually even closer. And is this a clue? So what does Lena say on these three so-called Queen's pyramids closest to the rising sun, facing to the east next to the Khufu pyramid? 
It's important to point out that there are very grand mastabas in front of these pyramids, and even less grand mastabas behind the Giza pyramid, kind of in the shadow. They're more the, the workers' cemetery. Uh, but the noble cemetery is at the sunrise, the workers' cemetery at the sunset. That's important. In fact, most of the mastabas are found around the Khufu pyramid, <laughs> funnily enough, suggesting it was quite important enough to be near when buried. Um, now, you're going to be amazed at this because it is known that when the Khufu pyramid was built, the slope was not fully leveled. Um, and we know this, but there are uh, internal limestone, and we know there are internal, internal cli uh, limestone cliff remnants inside. This suggests this was very important to preserve this. This was sacred. This was a sacred rock, a sacred plateau. And you don't mess with the sacred plateau. You build on it, but you don't mess with it. And that is true of the three little queen's pyramids. Lena points out that the three pyramids were built to accommodate the slope of the ground. So they are neither level, nor are they perfect squares. Remarkable. And he states they may have been planned uh, to a length of 88 to 89 cubits, which is one-fifth of the Khufu pyramid size, and with a slope of 50 to 52 degrees, each rose to a fifth of the Khufu pyramid's height. Each pyramid does not seem to be buttressed, but has a stepped internal nucleus of mastaba-like chunks stacked on top of each other. There is a packed core made of rubble, as well as remnants of fine casing stones with perfect joints. All three of these Queen's Pyramids have entrance passages on the north side, like most of the Giza Pyramids, and it's very much of a, con a continuation of the Third Dynasty culture. The only difference is that while the Third Dynasty Pyramids are a, a north-south oriented cult, a north-south temple around the pyramids, a north-south wall. That is not the case here, where we have this massive east-west causeway facing the rising sun. It's like another culture has entered Egypt, which venerates the rising sun, but incorporates some of the earlier traditions. So, two or more cults are going on. Very interesting. And when it comes to these little queen pyramids in front of the Khufu pyramid, when one travels through the north passage, enters through the north passage, one then actually, uh, where do you think one goes, left or right, to get to the bur so-called burial chamber? Actually, you turn to the right, and this is presumably because the left has always been seen as evil for an unknown reason. Now, what about the queens? Uh, since archaeologists consider these as burial tombs, Lena considers that the first pyramid to the north was for Hetaferas, mother of Khufu. The next queen was Merietes, who lived a long life in the reigns of Sneferu, Khufu, Khafre, and possibly uh, the occupants of the Mastabas nearby are the sons of these two. Now the northern, the southernmost might be uh, that of Queen Henutsen, because in Dynasty 21 to 26, a chapel mentioning her name, which which doesn't come down to us from the Old Kingdom, was built on the north, on the eastern base of this pyramid, and this helps us to fill in some of the blanks. Now, surprisingly, Lena only actually devotes two paragraphs, uh, in, uh, one in, in, in an illustration to the three little Menkore pyramids. So now we're moving to the Menkore pyramids. They're smaller than the Queen's pyramids of the Khufu pyramids. They're actually maybe a smaller by about a third, and they look like stacked masabas. Uh, the third, Lena points out, is close to the central axis of the Menkore pyramid, and it's possibly a satellite pyramid, um, what's called a satellite pyramid, which was attached to uh, uh, temples by the Middle Kingdom. In the Middle Kingdom, basically, you had a massive temple with a small pyramid, and um, and, and the, the pyramid got smaller and the temple got bigger throughout Egyptian civilization. Um, now, the satellite pyramid is also known as a, as a car pyramid. Uh, basically, what that means, we translate that, in, I would translate that in Chinese, I've done that before, as a qi pyramid. Uh, the ka and ba is the, the, the qi and fo in China. Uh, these two uh, concepts, I think they're the same concepts. Um, and he said the, the one did contain a granite sarcophagus, which had its own eastern chapel. Interesting. To Lena, this suggests it was used as a queen's burial, but he acknowledges it also could be the site of the king's mummification, as others have suggested. He states that the other two pyramids were either built intentionally as step pyramids or left unfinished. Lena also claims that the cased pyramid, uh, the perfect looking one, was a satellite pyramid which was then taken over for use by one of Menkore's queens, possibly Kamerernebti II. 
He states that all three of the pyramids had mud brick chapels and presumably all received burials of queens. He states that the body of a young woman was found in the middle uh, pyramid. Now, for an unknown reason, the middle pyramid, Khafre's pyramid, does not have three little pyramids. But maybe that's because there needed to be nine pyramids for some reason, and we'll see why uh, perhaps later on. I personally favour the explanation that these are not tombs at all, but a religious time capsule designed to protect Egypt forever, thus immortalising Khufu's name, since he was the builder, he was the head. So... One can clearly see royal tombs nearby, which are not the same size as the pyramids, so I just don't quite understand the insistence that these are mere tombs, when clearly they're not tombs, they're something else. They're something uh, four-sided, they're something massive. Uh, what are they? So, um, uh, so um, I, I've recently been saying that the, the Great Pyramid is actually, on all pyramids, are clones of Mount Meru, the world mountain in India. And uh, because uh, the Egyptian word for pyramid is uh, mer, and I think I've offered abundant proof for that by now um, in different videos on my official Facebook. So it's not just a tomb. Um, I and I, I hope that through through my work, you know, I can begin to make an impact. But it could take decades or centuries, you know, for the ideas to shift. Um, I've done enormous research into this, and it's clear to me that just about every pyramid of any shape and size has some certain consistent elements, but all are clones of Meru, even the, the word is the same in Egypt and Mer. But anyway, let's continue. So Egypt, uh, Giza is filled with so many little things that we cannot, we just cannot include all of them in this video, but you know, I, I hope you're enjoying it so far. Now regarding the Menkore Little Pyramids, Werner remarkably claims that it is certain that Little Pyramids contained the consorts of Menkore. Now how can he be so sure? Well, he can't really, but he says that. Now, all pyramids at Giza had their own courtyards, and this is true of Little Menkore Pyramids, which were surrounded by a fence. The Menkore complex itself was surrounded by perimeter walls, actually. And note the word perimeter, by the way, is almost the same as pyramid. So accurate measurement of perimeters may have originated in pyramid measure because what was of that size? It's just enormous. So, uh, and you wanted to get measures accurate when you were building a pyramid. You didn't necessarily get them accurate maybe when you were building a house. Now, Werner um, states that the bones of a young woman were found in one of the Menkore pyramids, as does uh, Lena. But Le uh, Werner adds the information that it was a pink sarcophagus on the west wall of the burial chamber. He, he talks a bit more about these uh, uh, than Lena does about these uh, Menkore pyramids. Furthermore, we learn from Werner that the little pyramids are 10 meters across. And now we are going to start to speculate. And if you want to hear the speculation, then keep listening. Because if you want insight into the nearby solar boats and other details, look no further than Germanic mythology. This seems to be incredibly ancient and may have been shared with the pre-Egyptians. And I think the solar boats are actually a Nordic ship called Nagelfara or Nailfara, or maybe even Knucklefara or Bonefara. We don't quite know what it means, but it's famous in Nordic mythology and in so associated in terms of its appearance with the end of the world. Now, in a related thing, I have detected an English or even Germanic speaking civilization before Egypt which founded Egypt, and you can see this in the words the Egyptians use. It is full of Germanic words in ancient Egypt, the ancient Egyptian tongue. The British Isles housed a pyramid builder civilization of what the later uh, invading Britons called tall giants, presumably English, presumably they were English or Frisians uh, before the Britons took over and then the English took over again in an earlier time. And these people built Silbury Hill and Newgrange, which I take to be a parallel pyramid builder civilization occurring at the same time as Egypt. And I'd like you to forget what you think pyramid means because uh, we stopped building them in 2000 BC in the old world, except in China. So don't listen to anyone who tells you what pyramid means or whether something's a true pyramid or not a true pyramid. They're, they're going by the shape alone, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, crazy. Now, I think we can use Nordic mythology to explain what is happening at Giza, but I must caution that we don't really seem to have the complete original versions of the Nordic texts, as they are all over the place, and they seem to be based on combined traditions. Uh, we, and, and we also, the, the Nordic accounts uh, um, seem to have also passed through many dis, disinterested hands before being recorded, so it's a bit of a disjointed mess. Now, 
Even uh, pyramid itself, I have to say, has a Germanic etymology. Before we explain what the nine pyramids are, pyramid, it's a Germanic word. Um, I've discovered, and you don't have to agree, it's simply burgmo, which means north-facing mountain, due to the shared root with the word borealis in burg. So a burg, I, I presume, is a north-facing mountain, and, and world pyramid faces the north, uh, world mountain faces the north, it's in the north in Hindu mythology. Uh, to this we have the word mid or mot appended, uh, which either means hill or moat, or, or both. Uh, but probably a moat, since we're already, we've already mentioned the hill, haven't we, in the berg. So berg mot, this is pyramid. And pyramid is, seems to be the Greek version. There were Greeks in Spain. Um, the Spanish mountains are called pyramids, Pyrenees. Um, it, this, this word seems to be applied to mountains, as well as things that look like mountains. It's a mountain type word. And I think the Greeks had their own way of saying what they had heard, is my guess, which is why they came up with the word pyramid, but it's based on a Germanic word, bergmot. Now, this idea occurs with, uh, accords with some of Robert Temple's work. In his book, Egyptian Dawn, he says the Egyptians came from elsewhere, and he vaguely alludes to Europe or European people living elsewhere who lived in Egypt. And so now let's look at this boat. This uh, the, the the boat uh, the Nordic boat is Nagelfar. It's made of nails or skin or body parts. And what I did, I went to look in mythology for a boat, and well, I found one in Nordic mythology. And this could be what the Egyptian so-called solar boats are. Um, and the Egyptian version is uh, is sewn wood. So it's actually wood that's been stitched together with uh, string, basically, and rope. Uh, is it Nagelfar? Now, the Sphinx, what do you want to know what the Sphinx is? The Sphinx is probably Fenrir, a giant dog known as uh, Vanangander, or Monster of the River Van. This river monster idea explains possibly just what the Sphinx is, a monster of Ragnarok. Thus, this was an Egyptian version of the river monster. So, we have Nagelfar, we have Fenrir, uh, and they work together with the giant serpent in Germanic, Germanic mythology, at the end of the world. So straight away, this is a Giza is a monument possibly devoted to the end of the world. At Ragnarok, what happens is Odin and uh, will be devoured by the wolf Fenrir. The reason Odin is probably being devoured is his name means Buddha or body. body. It's so similar. So he's the sacrifice. He's the sacrifice. So he's going to be eaten by Fenrir, the Sphinx. Then Thor fights with the world serpent and they slay each other. Uh, the world serpent, uh, also known as Jormungandr, um, is also for some reason called the Midgard serpent. And this is weird, because you see, the world serpent is birthed by the underworld giant. So he lives underworld, un underground with the dog. But he's called the Midgard serpent, which is our world, the world of humans. So uh, this is odd. So he's actually living with us. He's here. And he wraps around all the oceans of the world. And so he doesn't live in hell, but he lives in our world, almost like the rings of Saturn surrounding it. It's it's bizarre and curious, but I think it's important. Now we're going to explain why there are nine pyramids. In Nordic mythology, and this is what you've been waiting for, thanks for being patient, in Nordic mythology there is something called the nine worlds. And I shouldn't even say mythology, because we've entered Norse cosmology. And these nine worlds are called Nyheimar. The names of the nine worlds are Niflheim, the realm, the, the world of ice and mist, Muppelheim, the, the world where a fire giant lives, Asgard, the world of the Acer, Midgard, realm of humans, Jotunheim, the realm of giants, Vanaheim, realm of the Vanir, Alfheim, the world of the bright elves, Schwartelheim, realm of the black elves, and Helheim, the realm of humans who have died, which is hell. And you might have guessed that Heim seems to mean world. Now, we speak of nine worlds, but there are actually three main ones. Asgard, Midgard, Helheim, and the other three are subsidiaries of the main three. So that's how it works. And uh, I find that very interesting because we have at Giza, we have three main pyramids, three main world mounds or worlds, and two of them have three subsidiaries. So there are nine worlds coexisting, and now we can start to understand Giza as literally the entire 
universe, the center of the universe, the Mer or Meru, the main mountain mixed with the nine Norse worlds coexisting simultaneously represented as lesser mountains. In Norse mythology, the first thing that exists is the tree, alone in the void. Call it an electrical spark if you want. Around its roots are the nine realms. The realms started to mix and boom. Two creatures emerged, a giant Immer and a cow Odhumla. Now, by licking the ice realm, the cow Odhumla uncovered Buri, which presumably means buried, the ancestor of the gods. Buri and the giantess Bestla create the first gods, Odin, V, and Ve. Meanwhile, Immer is cloning himself to create more giants, literally spawning other gods through mitosis. It's bizarre. Odin and his brothers now gang up and kill Ymir, and everyone around him drowns in his blood. Eventually, man and woman are actually created from two trees. And this is stunning, as it shows it was considered man didn't emerge from animals, but an upright vegetable organism, and this may have been taught in ancient schools. Now, um, Asgard, for instance, realm of the Aesir, um, I'm sure where we get Osiris, king of the resurrection god, as you go uh, to Asgard uh, to possibly resurrect. It makes a lot of sense. I think the Egyptians mashed the ISO together into Osiris. So let's explain Giza. Um, guess what? The descending passages also seem re replicated in this because to get into hell, it is stated in the mythology that one must walk downhill um, uh, and, and, and uh, down a long slope in order to get there. And that seems to be what the descending passages of the pyramids literally are. And I've, I've made a video before showing that the Giza pyramid literally has the three Germanic levels, the Helheim, the Midgard, and the Asgard. So the nine pyramids of Giza are possibly the nine worlds of Norse cosmology. I see the word nine realm online, nine realms. Now, uh, I've said that myself, but realm actually only means kingdom, so let's call it nine worlds. Thus, nine world mountains. We do know from Arab legend that the pharaoh Surid, I think that's his real name, the real name of Kufu, Kufu whose other name being merely Kopf in German or Guava in Polish, it just means head. So Kufu just means head, but his name was something else. Built the pyramids as he thought, thought the world was going to end. He was told by his astrologers the world was going to come to a conclusion or Egypt would at least be destroyed and... He wanted to preserve the science, so he built this either to stop it from happening, or to to create um, to create a mythology, a, a, a cosmology, uh, a Ragnarok situation, um, to make sure it would would be reborn. Um, you know, it, Giza is amazing if it is if it is Norse mythology or if it isn't. Thus, we have an end of world uh, scenario at Giza. So, how does it end at Ragnarok? Well. According to mythology, first a hard winter comes with plenty of ice and snow. Then Surtur, which sounds like Satan or Sauron, doesn't it? Uh, the fire giant appears and consumes the world in flame. While this is happening, simultaneously the Midgard serpent breaks free. Uh, it, it lets go of its head, uh, of its tail, with its head, and it starts churning the waters around Midgard. So it creates tsunamis and all these uh, such things. And this sinks the continent or sinks the whole earth. While this is happening, Fenrir the Great Wolf, which I think must be the Sphinx, which points to the sun, breaks free of his chains, leaps up, and devours the sun. So in other words, this, this Ragnarok might be happening at sunrise. The existing gods at Asgard know they will lose this war, but they know a new world will emerge. I think for some reason this mythology was also shared by the early Egyptians and they incorporated it at Giza. Thanks and put your comments below. And to summarise, Giza was the cosmology of the universe and all its science in stone. Just amazing. And I think they vary the size to represent planets and stars also. As you will know from my earlier videos from several years ago, they incorporated literally all the science they could at Giza. Cheers!